Go ahead and turn your Bibles, please, to the book of Genesis, chapter 12. Book of Genesis, chapter 12. There's a man in the Word of God, one of the most significant men, I guess we could say, in the Word of God. As God is going to start the nation of Israel, He calls a man by the name of Abram. And Abram is later referred to as the friend of God. Abram is a man that exhibits great faith and great trust in the Lord. Abram uh, fulfills the promises of God while God fulfills His promises in the life of Abram. His name later changed to Abraham. But I don't want to focus on Abraham tonight. I want to focus on someone else in the narrative involved in Abraham. Abraham. A person in the Old Testament that very little, if anything good, is said about him. You're hard pressed to find something good in the life of Lot. The closest thing you can come to is that when Abraham goes, Lot goes as well. That's about the only positive thing in the entire life of Lot found in the Old Testament. He is an almost unredeemable individual with no redeeming qualities, no good points. You can't say, well, at least he did this because there's nothing about him that any Christian that I know or that you know should be striving to exemplify. But uh, Lot's problem was the same problem that Achan had. Remember, Achan saw that goodly, goodly Babylonian garment and he saw all that, uh, all that treasure from Jericho and he took it. The same problem that Samson had that Brother Polly preached about for a couple of nights. Samson never fully surrendered himself to God until God had his eyes taken out in Gaza by the Philistines. His eyes always wandered and Lot's eyes always wander. And he's always, when his eyes wander, he's always going from someplace better than where he is going to end up going. And I want you to know this, that in the life of Lot. Look if we will, you will please in Genesis chapter 12 and keep your Bible open to the book of Genesis. We're going to be between chapter 12 and chapter 19. A quick biographical sketch, if you will, of some of the things in the life of Lot. Look at verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and, uh, I, 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 and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless him that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot, his first mention here, went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all of their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And from thence, uh, and he removed from thence unto, uh, unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, Skip over to chapter 13, please. After a sojourn down in Egypt, we'll deal with that in just a moment. Notice what it says. And Abram went up, verse 1, out of Egypt, and he, uh, he and his wife and all that he had and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai under the place of the altar which he had made there at the first and there Abram called on the name of the Lord and Lot also which went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together and there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled in the land and Abram said unto Lot let there be no strife I pray thee between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen for we be brethren is not the whole land before thee separate thyself I pray thee from me if thou wilt take the left hand then I will go to the right if thou wilt depart to the right hand then I will go to the left and Lot watch this lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zoar and Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan 
And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. And Ab Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. And the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, watch it, and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Again, keep your Bible open. We're going to stay right in this area of Scripture. But I want you to notice the vision of Lot. The vision of Lot. Christian, it's a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale of this man who starts out doing some things correctly. It's a cautionary tale of a man that stands beside of Abram. It's a cautionary tale from a man who was there when the first altar is built after they've left the Ur of the Chaldees. It's a cautionary tale of a man who starts out with everything going his way and ends up one of the most despicable people in all the Word of God. I don't know about you, but the more I study about Lot, the dirtier I feel. It's almost as if the more I read about him, the more I'm disgusted at his wickedness, at the depths of his sin, and the level of his depravity. But it all starts just as it does with you me, it all starts when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. The Lord and Father, we thank you for this evening. Oh, we pray that you'll bless the message tonight. Have your will and way in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice the first vision of Lot is his vision of departure. There is Lot in a wonderful place. I want you to think about that. We talk all the time, and man, I've heard many messages on Barnabas, who did not go with the Lord, uh, with Paul on his second missionary journey. It was replaced with Silas. I've heard messages on Mark, who went home after they started that first missionary journey. And people will say, wow, he could have been there at the very beginning of the mission, uh, the mission that turns the world upside down for God. God, and he went home. Or Barnabas was in so much love with Mark that he did not go on that second missionary journey as Paul plants more churches, establishes more churches, visits the old churches and all of that. And people will say, boy, they really missed out on an opportunity. I want you to understand something carefully. Lot went with Abraham. There is no nation of Israel. There are no God's chosen people. There are no peculiar people. There are no, uh, there are no royal priesthoods. Nothing at all. And Abraham starts the whole thing when God calls him. And Lot was there. And yet Lot is going to leave. Can you imagine having the privilege to stand at an altar beside of Abraham? Can you imagine having the privilege of watching God multiply Abraham's wealth over and over, and Lot's wealth, by the way, over and over? And now all of a sudden, Lot is going to see something that is going to take him away from such a wonderful place. You say, Brother Harper, how is that possible? He has everything. He has wealth. He has Abraham. He has the Lord. How is it possible that something would distract him? I don't know. How is it possible that people that have come to Capital Baptist Church and been involved in a church where the Bible is preached, where the music is conservative and Christ-honoring, where the people are friendly, where there's uh, excitement going on, people being led to the Lord, people walk in the aisles. What is it that distracts people from a church like that? The same things that distract Lot from serving with Abraham. He beheld all the plains of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. I want you to notice the first thing we see about Lot's vision is that it was sanitized. It was sanitized. You know what Lot saw? He saw all the good. He didn't see the bad. He saw it looks like Egypt as you come up out of Zohar. He, first, he saw Egypt, but he never saw the bondage. He saw the garden of the Lord. He saw the garden of Eden. You know what he didn't see? He didn't see the serpent. He saw the drinking, but never saw the drunkenness. He saw the buzz, but didn't see the addiction. In other words, what, what Lot saw is the same thing that you and I see when we're first confronted with sin, when we first see wickedness, we're first distracted from being right there at the altar, from being right there where the sacrifices are offered. When we first get distracted from that, it's always something that looks a whole lot better going in than it's going to look like coming out. 
Lot saw a sanitized vision, if you will. But the reason he saw it sanitized is because Satan never tells the truth. Remember, Jesus said he's the father of lies. He said when he tells a lie, he's speaking of himself because he's the father of it. Or in, in Genesis chapter 13, what did it say? Lot lifted up his eyes. And he saw that plain that it looked like the garden of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. How would Lot have had any clue what the Garden of Eden looked like? Is it Almighty God that whispered in the ear of Lot and said, you know what, Lord, uh, Lot, the plains of Jordan looks like the Garden of Eden because God was there. Adam and Eve are long since dead. There's only one person alive that could have been whispering in the ears of Lot, telling him like that the plains of Jordan look like the Garden of the Lord. There's only one person that was there that could be describing it to Lot. It's the liar himself. Boy, oh boy, Lot, that sure looks good, doesn't it? Doesn't matter that you have to walk away from Abraham. I point out in another message that there's another option. Abraham says, here's your option, Lot. You can go to the left and I'll go to the right. Or you can go to the right and I'll go to the left. There's another option that Lot seemingly doesn't even think of. What Lot could have said is, you know what, Abraham? I don't need to have any cattle because as long as I'm with you and God's taking care of you, the blessings are going to rub off on me. So here's what we do. We don't have any more herdmen. I give up all my herdmen. I give everything to you. It's all your cattle. It's all your flock. It's all your tents, and I'll just be content to bask in the glory of Almighty God because, Abraham, I would rather give up everything that I have to stay right here by the altar with you. Amen. But that doesn't occur to Lot. It also doesn't occur to a lot to say, you know what, Abraham, that plain over there is well watered everywhere. Maybe you ought to take your flocks there. I'll go to the place that isn't as well watered, Abraham, because everything I have I owe to you. That doesn't even cross Lot's mind because Lot sees it all sanitized. He doesn't see the problems. He doesn't see the sin. He doesn't see the wickedness at first. All he sees is a plain that's well watered everywhere that looks just like the Garden of Eden. Not only was it sanitized, but it was separating. Think about that for just a moment. They separated themselves the one from the other. Lot went one way and Abraham went another. And you know what you never find after that? You never find Lot at an altar. You never find Lot worshiping the Lord after that. He's going to separate from Abraham. He's going to separate from this man that's the friend of God. And it's, it's understandable that they should separate because how can two walk together except they agree, Amos 3 and verse 3. How can two walk together unless they agree? And Lot and Abraham obviously aren't agreeing. Abraham is looking up. Lot is looking east. He's going to separate from Abraham, but he's also going to separate from the Lord. Do you realize in the life of Lot, you never see him do one, uh, you never see him say one spiritual thing? Up until the day that the angels come and tell him that the fire and brimstone is going to fall tomorrow, and they tell him, if you have any other family members, you better warn them. And then Lot goes and says, well, the Lord's going to destroy this city tomorrow. Do you realize that's the only time you find Lot mentioning the Lord until uh, Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed? He doesn't speak scripturally. He does not stand up for the word of God. He never honors Almighty God. Lot is going to separate not just from Abraham. He's going to separate from the Lord himself. He does nothing spiritual at all. Notice, please, we should speak spiritually, shouldn't we? Amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 19 and verse 14. I love what Jeremiah said in chapter 20 and verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was when in my heart a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Jeremiah said, I tried not to talk about the Lord for one day, and it just didn't work. And Lot goes his entire life, and we never find a single mention of him praising, extolling, or worshiping Almighty God. Not only does he not speak scripturally, he doesn't perform, uh, uh, he doesn't perform sacrificially. You'll notice that every time that it mentioned that Abraham was building a, an altar, it does not say, and there, they built an altar. It always says, and there, he built an altar. 
Well, that reminds me of some young people. No offense to the young people in the auditorium. But over the years, and this, uh, th this is almost tragic. I can tell you the honest to goodness truth right now three times. Three times in 25 years. Three. When I've been carrying boxes in from my CD table, has a teenager stopped and said, Brother Harper, can I help you with that? They don't even think about it. Lot stands there and watches Abraham building an altar. Lot stands there and watches Abraham offer a sacrifice. But the Bible never tells us that Lot built an altar. It never tells us that Lot offered a sacrifice. No, Lot is going to separate from Almighty God as he separates from Abraham as well. Never do you find Lot at an altar again. Never do you find Lot at a sacrifice again. Lot's life, as far as spiritually and scripturally, is completely over between him and Almighty God. Notice, please, there's the vision of departure. He sanitized it, and it separated. Notice number two, though. There's the vision of depravity in chapter 13. Now, we read it just a moment ago. Which, by the way, let me point something out. Do you know as soon as Lot left, as soon as Lot went to the east, what did the Lord say to Abraham? He said, Abraham, look north. Look south. Look east. Amen. And look west. It's all yours. Do you know what? If Lot had stayed, he chose to separate from Abraham so he could go east. When if he'd have just waited, he could have gone east with Abraham. Notice, please, the second vision of Lot is his vision of depravity. He has now pitched his tent towards Sodom. Chapter 11, verse, uh, 13, verses 11 through 13, And Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But this is still there. But the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Lot reveals to us, does he not? as he pitches his tent toward Sodom. It's not just that he went to the plain that was well watered everywhere. See, Lot could be like most Christians. Lot could say, well, the reason I went in that direction was for my sheep and for my oxen so they would have a place to graze. Christians will say, well, the reason I hang out with so... Uh, the reason I go to the bar is not to drink so that I can be a witness. The reason I do this is so I can uh, advance the cause of Christ. The reason We always have spiritual sounding reasons, but Lot even gives up on that right away. If Lot had just pitched his tent, not toward Sodom, if Lot had just moved into this wilderness, into this plain of Jordan, and brought all his cattle and his flocks and his herds and his tents with him, we might be able to believe that maybe Lot had good intentions from the beginning, but he immediately reveals that he had, had nothing to do with the herdmen, had nothing to do with the flocks, had nothing to do with the strife of Abraham. Lot always wanted to go to Sodom. Right. It's been his plan for a while now. Oh, yes, it's wonderful and spiritual to sit there between uh, Bethel and Hai and watch Abraham as he talks to God, but it's kind of boring after a while. When you see the flashing lights of Sodom, yeah. you hear the sounds emanating from Gomorrah. It just sounds like they're having so much fun. Isn't it amazing how the world tries to act like what they're doing is fun? I'm telling you what, tomorrow night after the last night of Jubilee, when I go over to Pastor's house and stay way too late, and finally they're all yawning in unison, Pastor and Mrs. Pastor and Marco, even the dog is yawning, and I'm like, okay, I'll go then. And I've had one of, one of Mrs. Pastor's iced coffees, and I know I'm going to be up to 3 o'clock in the morning. And I head back to the Wheeler's house where I'm staying this, this time uh, for the first time. I go head back to the Wheeler's house. Do you know what I'm not going to have? A hangover. Amen. You know what I'm not going to have? Guilt. You know what I'm not going to be worried about doing whether something is going to be found out, whether someone is going to investigate, whether someone's going to look at my phone and see the wrong thing on there. I'm not going to worry about that at all. You know why? Because if you're serving the Lord, there's no guilt, there's no hangover, there's no coming down from a high. The high that we have coming to church is because we know that one day we're going to see our Savior. One day this is all going to be over. He's going to split the eastern sky and what a day that will be. Amen. 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 That's right. 
But Lot's decided what he wants to do. He's attracted by the lights. He's attracted by the sounds. His motivation is the, he's, he's witnessing the activity and he's also wanting the action. Lot wants to be in the middle of it. Not only do we see his motivation, but quickly we see his movement. Lot, now, we find him when you, at, 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 at verse 12 of chapter 13, with his tent pitched towards Sodom. By the time you get to chapter 14, he lives there. By the time you get to chapter 14, he's not dwelling in a tent anymore. He's dwelling in a house. He's investing in real estate in Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible does not tell us when in the life of Lot that he moved from the plains of Jordan into the city of, Jeru uh, into the city of Sodom. It doesn't tell us when he physically did that. But I can tell you when he mentally and spiritually did it. When he beheld all the plains of Jordan, that they were well watered everywhere. At that moment, Lot's plan was to move right downtown into Sodom and Gomorrah. We saw his motivation. We saw his movement. We also see he gets married. <laughs> Not only does he buy a house, but he's putting down some roots, isn't he? He has no plans at all to ever go back to Abraham. He has no plans at all to ever go to another altar. It isn't even crossing his mind to worship Jehovah God. He's raising a family not in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He's raising a family that doesn't know anything about Almighty God. When the angels finally show up here in just a few verses and they tell Lot that the city's going to be destroyed and Lot goes to his sons and he goes to his sons-in-law that married his daughters, do you realize that every single member of Lot's family that wasn't sitting at the table when the angels were there didn't believe him? He seemed as one that mocked unto them. They thought it was a pretty funny joke. Lot, even in this though, he's seen God deliver. Look at chapter 14, please. A lot of times we skip over that in the life of Lot. Lot's living in Sodom. He's no longer dwelling safely by Abraham's side at the altar. He's no longer just looking at the sin off in the distance. Now he's living in Sodom. He's sitting at the gate. He says, he's no longer saying, I think I'd like to try that. Now he's involved in it. No longer is he experimenting. Now he's immersed. He's involved. He is practicing. He's sitting at the gate. He's taking a wife. He's having children. No longer in a tent, but in a house. And yet God still protects him. In chapter 14, a man by the name of Kurdeleomer uh, comes into town and he defeats the kings of all those five cities in the plain. And he takes Lot hostage. Abraham hears about it. Someone escapes and comes and tells Abraham. Abraham takes his 318 trained servants and he chases this Kedrilaomer down until he defeats him. Now after that, the Bible tells us that he frees Lot. Look if you will please. We'll look at verse, uh, verse 16 please. Uh, Genesis chapter 14 verse 16. The Bible says this. And he brought back all the goods... And also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedorlaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shiva, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, give, uh, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Huh? Watch what happens. Abram delivers the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. He delivers Lot. Melchizedek steps out and honors Abram. Abram sacrifices to Melchizedek, the priest of God. The king of Sodom, this wicked man over this wicked city, comes out to Abraham and says, Hey, 
Thanks a bunch. You can have anything that you want. Just give me the people back. You can have all the spoils. Even the wicked uh, king of the city of Sodom had a thank you in his heart. Do you want what you won't read? You won't see Lot saying thank you. Wouldn't this been a perfect time for Lot to say, Uncle Abraham, I'm going to go home with you now. He just heard the king of Sodom give everything that Lot owns to Abram. <laughs> everything that Lot has now belongs to Abram, but Abram gives it back. Notice how many times Lot is blessed by the hand of Abraham in his life, and yet he still continues to go in the wrong direction. He still continues to sit there in Sodom and Gomorrah. He still continues to be wicked. But then what happens? Chapter 19, please, quickly with me if you will chapter 19 he fails to be grateful he frails as a believer doesn't he you look at the life of lot again there's almost no redeeming quality to him at all he's sitting there when the the angels come into town in chapter 19 where's lot sitting he's sitting in the gate which means he's in some sort of position of leadership in verse 6, as the men are trying to press and get Lot to give him the two angels that have come into his house, what does Lot say? And by the way, there can be very few more words as despicable as these are. With the level of wickedness in our society today, I don't think that verses 6 through 8 have even crossed the mind of the LGBT movement. That's how bad what he says right. is. And Lot went out at the door, verse 6, unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren. Did you get that? I pray you, brethren. You didn't find him calling Abraham brethren when Abraham was delivering him. I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Yeah. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. No father with a daughter can stomach those words. No, no way. My daughter's getting married. I get to give her away. She's given me permission to say a few words when I give her away. I called her the other day. I said, Charity, I think I know exactly what I'm going to say when Brother Dylan asked me who gives this girl, uh, this woman, to, uh, to her husband. I said, I know exactly what I'm going to say. She said, what's that, Dad? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <That's it. laughs> and here Lot stands. I know my daughter is going to marry a young man who's already an assistant pastor, who's graduated from a Bible college, who has in his bones the desire to serve Almighty God. And yet, I promise you this, as much as I'd like to sound spiritual, on that day I'm going to struggle just a little bit. Giving my daughter away to a man that loves her, to a man that loves the Lord, and to a man that serves the Lord is going to be difficult for me. Lot tries his, to give his daughters away to the men of Sodom. Do ye unto them as is good in your eyes. Do you realize what he's saying here? Excuse me, I'm not going to be graphic at all, I promise. He knows how wicked these men are. He knows how wicked their imaginations are. They're banging on the door trying to get a, a, a hold of these angels that are in there. And he says to these men, whatever you think is okay is okay with me. How despicable. Yeah, right. Almost want to spit when I talk about law. This vision as he looked towards Sodom and said, I think I want to try that. Look where he is now. Notice, please, number one, we saw his vision of departure. Number two, we saw his vision of de destruction. I'm sorry, the vision of de uh, debauchery, I'm sorry, if you will. I want you to notice number three, uh, depravity. Number three, his division of, uh, a vision of defiance. Excuse me for just a moment. The angels have warned him, destruction's coming tomorrow. 
Lot, his wife, his two virgin daughters are there. Look at chapter 19, verse 13. Let's read verse 12. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. Take everything that you can get, Lot. Get it out. All your family, get rid of them. Get them them out of here. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up! Get you out of this place. For the Lord... Notice he uses Jehovah there. For the Lord will destroy this place. But he saying to this one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth, and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought him forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Did you get that? They just picked him up. They just carried him out of the city. They planted him outside the city. They said, listen, go as fast as you can. Get up in the mountain. Fire and brimstone's going to fall. And go into the mountain. You'll be safe there. The God that just delivered him, the God that just protected him, has his angels say, if you listen to us, you'll be fine. And he says, oh, and not so. Not so, Lord. Watch what he says. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. Now hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto. And it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called uh, Zoar. Lot rejected the mercy of God. God said, this is how you'll be safe. Go to the mountains. Nope, don't think so. He's rejected the mercy of God. But notice carefully, please, he's resisted the leading of God. (laughs) You know, these these are angels standing there with Lot who struck an entire town with blindness. who are going to snap their fingers and fire and brimstone from God is going to fall. And Lot says, "I, I don't think you guys need to be telling me what to do. Doesn't he sound like a lot of Christians who started out right here at Capital Baptist Church or started out right there beside of Abraham? And now that they've gotten away from the Lord, they don't want to hear anything from the Lord at all. They don't want the Lord to interfere with their lives. They don't want the Lord to cause them any kind of discomfort along the way. But he also remembered the temptation. (laughs) Notice what he says. I want to go to this little town called Zoar. Remember when Lot looked out and saw the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere as Egypt, as the garden of the Lord, as Egypt, as thou comest up from Zoar. Lot has ruined his entire life. His house is gone. His sons are dead or about to be. His daughters and his sons-in-law are dead. He has no belongings whatsoever. Out of the at least ten people in his life, six of them are already gone as the fire and brimstone are going to fall on them because they won't leave the city. And Lot is still craving what he was craving when he first walked away from Abraham. You would think that Lot would have learned a lesson. But he's just like me and you, isn't he? Once you start getting away from the Lord, his brother McBride said last night, once you start sinning, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Where was Abraham? When all this is going on, when the fire and brimstone is beginning to fall. Genesis chapter 19, verses 27 and 28. Skip over there for just a moment. And Abraham got up early in the morning 
to the place where he stood before the Lord. <laughs> yeah. See, Lot could have been standing there. Amen. <laughs> Notice what he says. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and behold, beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. We know what happens. Lot's wife turns around, turns into a pillar of salt right before his very eyes. Yeah. All that's left is Lot and the two bargaining chip little girls. Notice, we saw number one, his vision of departure. Number two, his vision of depravity. Number three, his vision of defiance. Number four, the vision, the vision of destruction. The final failure of Lot. He's now looked around Zoar and decided that he doesn't need to be in Zoar. Skip down a couple verses, please, if you will, with me. Look at verse 29. And I'm sorry, verse, uh, uh, verse 28. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I got the wrong verse. Uh, uh, and it's verse 30, I'm sorry. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. He couldn't go to the mountain because he wasn't safe there. It's the one time Lot's correct. It's not safe in the mountain. He went up to the mountain and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. I will not read the intervening verses. Every adult in the room knows what happens. I will say the daughters get Lot drunk. Doesn't it amaze you just a little bit that this man who saw everything that he owned burned up still manages to have wine? It does not look to me like his daughters have to coerce him to drink with them. He's a, not just a failure as a dad. He's a failure as a man. His two daughters conceive. We'll just say it that way. His two daughters conceive and now he's a grandfather. <laughs> you know what being a grandfather is? It's the opportunity for parents who are really bad parents to be really great grandparents. Isn't it? I mean, if you're a great parent, you're going to be a great grandparent as well. But haven't we all seen someone who wasn't that good a parent, but turned out to be just an absolute incredible grandparent? It's a second chance for a lot, isn't it? Yes, in spite of how these boys came into the world, in spite of the circumstances of their conception, here is Lot with two little boys, one named uh, Moab and the other named Ben-Ami, and there he is in this cave together. And you know what's going to happen, right? Lot's going to set those two grandsons down on his knee and say, let me tell you about your uncle Abraham. Let me tell you how he came out of the earth of the Chaldees. Let me tell you about him building an altar. Let me tell you about him being the father of a great nation. Let me tell you how God delivered me from Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me tell you how... God has taken care of my life. And when I was, in, when I was captured by uh, those, those, uh, those kings that God sent Abraham in to deliver me, let me tell you how good God is. No! Right. That's not what Lot does. Yeah. Right. Lot raises boys that worship a God by the name of Chemish and a God by the name of Baal. The nephew of the man called of Jehovah to be the patriarch of the nation of Israel doesn't even raise his grandsons to know about Jehovah. It's a failure as a man, failure as a dad, failure as a believer. He's a failure as a grandfather. He's a failure in every single area of his life. And all of that from chapter 13, chapter 12 when we first meet him, until we find him sitting in that tent holding his uh, illegitimately conceived grandsons in his arms. Did you see one redeeming quality? Not one. Isn't it amazing, though, that this man who has no redeeming qualities has a redeemer? Amen. <laughs> Look at Second Peter with me, please, for the next moment or two. You and I look at Lot and say, well, what a failure. God looks at Lot and says, there's a righteous soul there. Amen. We look at Lot and say, what a wicked man. And God says, hey, hey, hey. He's just Lot. Praise the Lord. 
You want to see a picture, and we've talked so much about it throughout this week. You want to see a picture of grace? Praise the Lord. God would save Lot. Amen. If you and I could choose, would we save Lot? Is there anybody else in the Old Testament who makes as big a mess of their lives and yet God takes the time out in the New Testament to make sure that He's not just a mess, that He's not just a waste, that there's no such thing as a waste, there's no such thing as someone who can be so wicked the grace of God can't save them. There's no sin so great that the blood of Christ cannot cover it. There is no wickedness so bad that His sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary is it good enough? I'm here to tell you if God would save this man that said, do ye unto them as is good in your eyes. And there's nobody in this room he wouldn't save. Oh, Brother Hopper, I've heard the gospel time and time again. I've rejected it over and over and over. Will he still save me? Let me tell you. Let me think about it for just a minute. Absolutely. Brother Harper, everybody in this auditorium thinks I'm saved. <laughs> Only I know I'm not. I'll be embarrassed. Would he still save me? He saved Lot. Amen. You want to talk about a man whose entire life is an embarrassment? Look, if you will, please, it's 2 Peter chapter 2. Lot was always looking in the wrong places. Look at verse, uh, verse uh, 7. And delivered just Lot. By the way, that's not only Lot. That is just or righteous Lot. Amen. Delivered just Lot. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. I didn't see that, did you? I saw a man calling them brethren. I saw a man trying to communicate with them and bargain with them. I don't see a man vexed. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Is there one person in this room, just one, that would call the lot of Genesis chapter 19 just or righteous? What God does. Praise the Lord. Amen. He doesn't just forgive. He washes it away. Hallelujah. He does. He takes what is unredeemable and redeems it what is unforgivable, and forgives it. Huh. If you're here today and you're lost, if he'd save Lot, he'll save anybody. Amen. If you're a Christian, stop looking towards Sodom. Yeah. Don't kid yourself that you're just looking at the plain of Jordan. Well, you should be looking unto Jesus, Amen. the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. You should be looking for that blessed hope. We preached about that yesterday. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. Our conversation is in heaven. Once also we look for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, might be fashioned like into His glorious body. Or Psalm 112, 121, verses 1 and 2. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills. From whence cometh my help. Oh, who are you looking for, David? My help cometh from the Lord. As a Christian, you get your eyes off the hills where the Lord's coming. You get your eyes off of the heavens. You get your eyes off of the author and the finisher. You get your eyes off of the Savior for just a few moments. The plains of Jordan are going to start looking like the Garden of Eden to you. It happened a lot. As you're sitting here as a Christian, it's time to put our focus back where it belongs. It's time to put our focus on the Lord and the Lord only. It's time to let all those other things distract us, not that distract us, just melt into the background and disappear. It's time to go from wolfish to lambish by putting our attention on our Savior and only on our Savior. He's the only one that can do that. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, I realize it's a Wednesday night and I realize most of the people in this auditorium are Christians, but I'm here to tell you, <laughs> you've... If no one else is willing to redeem you, Jesus is. Praise Amen. His grace is sufficient. Amen. His mercy endureth forever. Amen. And His love is enough. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. No one looking around.